Are you struggling to come up with original content week in and week out? Start a podcast. Interview your ideal clients. Let them talk about what they care about most and never run out of content ideas again. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey with Sweetfish Media. Guys, I've got with me today, Roshan Kariapa, who leads the marketing team at Vimo. Roshan, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Good, man. I'm glad to hear it. So we're going to be digging in to something I, I haven't talked about as in depth on the show yet, and that's how to build your marketing function in an early stage Uh, company. And so we're going to be digging into some of the metrics you should focus on and what campaigns are going to work. But before we get into all of that, Rashawn, I would love it if you would just give us all a little bit of background on yourself and what you and the folks at Vimo have been up to these days. Okay. So yeah, I'm Rashawn uh, and I've been with the early stage startups for a little over a decade now. Previously, I was an entrepreneur. Uh, I set up a boutique uh, digital firm called Wolf Labs, ran it for about four to five years. Now I lead marketing at Vimo and Vimo is a series B startup that is headquartered out of New York, uh, which operates in the CRM space, right? So I've primarily uh, been in sales product and marketing roles at early stage growth stage startups. And uh, I've done the whole zero to one journey more than a couple of times in my career. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something that I'm very passionate about uh, in terms of building functions, building teams and so on. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So do you want me to quickly define what uh, that means to me? What zero to one means? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you're referencing the, the Peter Thiel book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> it's, a, that's, it's a favorite of mine. Again, I, I, I knew when I, when I, uh, in offline, uh, when I was yeah. looking at how the conversation was going to be framed up, I was like, oh, okay, he's, he's a, a man after my own heart. But yes, mm-hmm. yes. For the folks listening, go ahead and talk about how that philosophy impacted you and what it's meant to you. Yeah, so that's one of my favorite books. And uh, to me, that whole zero to one thing is a metaphor for so many other things, right? For sure. Uh, Yeah, I mean, so what I mean by zero to one is, uh, you know, when you're starting up and you don't really have much of a brand or, you know, as a marketer, you're not really generating a lot of leads and there's very little content to work with. So you're basically starting things from scratch, right? And the whole journey involves like, you know, one is to establish momentum, uh, which is, you know, build a, build some sort of a brand, uh, uh, generate some leads, uh, hiring your team, basically, right? Building your team to enable this. And most of all, I think uh, making a tangible difference uh, and building influence in the company, right? So mm-hmm. uh, kind of moving the needle for the company through whatever you're doing. So that, uh, uh, you know, that is like a short summary of what I mean by going from zero to one. Yeah, no. And what's interesting about it, what I love about it is when, like you said, it's applicable in so many different ways. I read that book at a, I was a startup that was trying to penetrate a legacy market. And Mm -hmm. so I I took a lot of of things away from it in terms of, you know, from a sales perspective, Uh, but the team I'm on now, we're a really small sales team and we're taking on marketing functions. And so I'm really interested to hear how you talk about you know, building those marketing functions from, from the ground up. Cause we're kind of having to do that ourselves here. And so one of the things that you identify is, is one of the things you need to do early on is understanding what metrics you should focus on. Talk about that a little bit for us. Sure. So let me back up a little bit, right? Sure. So, so I think on day zero, right? So you have 
like an endless stream stream of uh, you know endless avenues that you could invest your time and effort on but you know before that i mean what you should really do is uh, figure out why you matter right and how you can help mm. so in my opinion and this is a very biased you know entrepreneur opinion of mine so which is that all of marketing exists basically to make sales easy right i mean it can it can vary to various uh, degrees basically right so on day zero what i would do is uh, basically figure out how sales work uh, sales works for your enterprise right uh, really figure out who the buyer is uh, how are they experiencing the product uh, you know product or service and you know what are the existing challenges in that buying process and how can you kind of smooth in the whole process right and that also involves uh, understanding your business at a very fundamental level right uh, so to me i mean most of the b2b saas businesses uh, belong in about two bra- two uh, buckets so one would be the enterprise which is the whole you know high ticket value long si- sale cycle uh, b2b market right where you know you're typically looking at uh, institutional buyers you're looking at uh, let's say an acv of 100k upwards or even a 30k upwards right and uh, where where a lot of the stuff that you do involves uh, sales enablement product marketing and so on right uh, and you know at the other spectrum of it uh, you have the sort of short sales cycle high velocity uh, sales right which is which is you know all of your 10 dollar 20 dollar products even up to let's say 2000 3000 dollar products mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. Uh, and you know fundamentally it requires a different kind of thinking uh, for both of these so Uh, so that's a good place for you to start uh, to fundamentally figure out what your company is uh, doing rather and uh, you know how you could kind of help that uh, company move the needle yeah no i i love that you start the whole thing out taking a stance you set it up like hey this is a biased opinion but the fact of the matter is if mm-hmm. if what you said is true right which is you have to define why you matter then you're yeah. going to have to take some stances that are that are biased you're going to have to take some stances that may not be you know controversial but it will certainly be uncommon and that's yeah. how you that is how you figure out who you are so this idea that all of marketing exists to make sales easy is is maybe not one that a lot of folks you know live out but yeah. when you're starting out i completely understand how that's got to be the way to go. So so thanks for backing us yeah. up a little bit and framing that up. Yeah. yeah, so just to add to that, right? Because there is a whole lot of FOMO in the beginning, right? Uh, there's a whole lot of fear of missing out, which mm-hmm. is that uh, you know, every day you'll get to read about somebody who's doing something awesome, like it could be a type of content or it could be some type of campaigns, uh, right? And there is this whole temptation to dive in head first and, you know, uh, do a bunch of these things just because, right? right uh, but yeah i mean it's it's really something that you have to figure out like you know what is relevant to your business i think that is step one in the whole mm-hmm. journey right yeah. mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you're right i think that some of the the sexier things the more fun things are those projects that you said folks are wanting to you know just dive into and i'm not a marketer so to speak but even yeah. i on linkedin when i'm when i'm listening to these prominent marketers that i look up to you're the dave gerharts of the world right i'm like yeah. ooh that looks like fun i want to try that <laughs> um, so i totally yeah. get it i totally yeah. get it but what you're saying is you got to stay grounded in okay again but why yeah. do we matter but what is this function really about and once you uh, agree and commit to the idea that it's there to make sales easier that's when you get into this idea of understanding what metrics to focus on i really want our listeners to hear that from you uh, and from my own selfish curiosity um what are those metrics that you think folks should be focusing on so as i mentioned there are like a couple of categories right so let's talk about uh, you know the second category which i mentioned which is like the low ticket value and you know high velocity sales right so here i mean you have to typically focus on creating like a large volume on top of the funnel so you could think about you know uh, website traffic uh and then converting a percentage of that right so the you know building that funnel out so on day zero for me to kind of establish momentum would be to get people to know about me right to get people to come to my website and you know know about my product and then kind of step two would be to figure out how i can get these people signed up and subscribed or you know convert to a paying customer right i'll be honest i'm not entirely familiar with that category of businesses because 
I've primarily operated in the enterprise marketing, you know, side of things, right? Uh, where, you know, again, these are long B2B sales cycles. So it could be four months or six months. And it's not really like a see, click and buy kind of an experience. So there's a lot of things that you have to do on the branding and the sales enablement side of things, right? Uh, so one of the one of the metrics that's really relevant in uh, that would be, you know, things like, uh, I mean, to me, the most most relevant metric would be how you can collapse sales cycles, right? So typically, I mean, if your sales cycles are like four to six months, can you kind of, uh, you know, collapse that to by about 20, 30%, you know, I mean, because that's, that's a real value to uh, the company as well. Yeah. Right. Right. And I, I love that. So are you talking about from a marketing team's perspective, right? Cause I understand a sales leader would be thinking about that, but their, their solution or their approach to that problem would be much different from the way a marketer would approach, okay, how do we shrink a sales cycle? So are you talking about that being a function and responsibility of a marketing team when you talk about shrinking that, that time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest pieces in this whole thing is aligning marketing with sales, right? So okay. as I mentioned up front, you know, I mean, all of marketing exists to make sales easy or incidental, Right. So you will definitely see an overlap and um, especially on the large ACV enterprise type of marketing, you know that it's, it's, very, it's a very sales-led uh, model, right? So obviously people are not going to come and like, you know, uh, look at all of the beautiful content that you've written on a website and, you know, get to experience a second later, right? So it's, and, you know, really the decision making, making is uh, complicated as well. Because uh, a lot of the times what I notice is, you know, I mean, the decision maker may not even use the product afterwards. So there's, right. there's really like, you know, three or four levels of people that you have to talk to. So right from your C-level folks who, who are going to like, you know, sign off on the contract to the influencers, to the IT guys and, you know, a whole bunch of people, right? And ultimately, uh, you have to be relevant to the person who's using it on the ground, right? So, yeah, so it's, it's fairly challenging. And yeah, yes, of course, there is an overlap between what marketing and sales does. I think that that is so key. Listen, this idea that, you know, the decision maker, right? The CMO or the VP of marketing aren't the ones who are pulling the trigger when it comes to buying or who are doing all the exploratory work. I've heard that before, but I haven't heard this idea of they're not the ones that are even using, they're not even the ones that are using the thing. And so that even more drives home the importance of understanding what type of campaigns will work uh, and yeah. what type of content will work if you're speaking to the person who is going to be using it, aka the person whose life or job you're trying to make easier with what yeah. you're selling versus the person who just has the power or you know the, the pen and the checkbook. I think that's yeah. huge. I'm glad that you, that you framed it up that way. Absolutely. Um, so- Go ahead. Sorry, let me give you an example, uh, uh, you know, which is kind of close to what I do, right? So let's take CRMs, for example. So CRMs have been around for about a couple of decades now. But, you know, according to various reports, uh, over a third of these deployments fail, right? And these are long deployments. I mean, it takes many multiple months or even, you know, I've seen things go up, you know, 18 months and, 12, you know, a couple of years and so on and so forth, right? So uh, these are you know, a lot of time, effort and investment goes into it. And a lot of reports say that, you know, over a third of these deployments fail. But if you ask me, it's closer to a 90% because if you really look at the strategic objectives being met, I mean, they're not really being met, right? Now, why is this? Because CRM still function as passive databases. So if you ask all of the managers and the leaders who are signing off on the the contracts, right? So what do they want to see? They want to see all of these beautiful reports and dashboards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that there is really nothing in it for the salesperson who's, you know, actually has to use it, right? So you mentioned that, you know, you're in sales, right? So how often do you, you know, (laughs) go back and, you know, say, put in all of this information that uh, uh, from an activity, right? So from a call or from a meeting or even, you know, after this podcast, so you're not going to go and like you know spend precious amount of time uh, putting on, putting in all of those that information on a CRM, right? So so yeah, I mean so the user adoption is like really really bad. So even some of the best CRMs have about 25 30 uh, percent adoption, right? So there again, you know, I mean it's a it's a like it's a whole uh, divergence between what really the person who 
is the decision maker wants and what someone who experiences the product uh, wants. Yeah. That's huge. That is huge. Listen, I want to, I, I could ask you more and more questions about this just because your, your background and your experience in this uh, lends itself to so much key insight. So I'll ask you two things. Give us one more piece of parting wisdom for folks trying to make this uh, zero to one in marketing thing happen. Uh, and then we'll get to the part where I get to pick your brain and see what you're putting in it uh, as far as what the learning resources that, that you're going to tell us about today. So sure. start with uh, your parting wisdom uh, and then let us know what you're, what you're reading and what's moving you these days. Sure. I'll break it down to five things, right? So if I were to you know, look at it, I would summarize it this way. So to begin with, I think you should focus on net positive momentum, right? Uh, don't really worry about like, you know, the numerous things that you could do. Just really focus on what's relevant for your business and start moving in, in kind of a general direction of goodness, right? Uh, so you can immediately start having some impact on uh, the sales and impact on your business as such. Uh, step two would be to kind of prioritize the speed of ex- execution, right? Do many things that you think are relevant for your business just to figure out, you know, if things work, right? So I often tell my team that, you know, hey, we're doing a bunch of these things just to just to figure out, just to rule out things that don't work, you know? So which brings me to the next step, which is to double down on what really works, right? So uh, I always believe in kind of taking calibrated risks. So I want to spend a little bit of time, a little bit of money on things uh, to quickly figure out if, if they're relevant for us and then double down, really double down on what works for us, right? And build a cadence around that. So the fourth thing that I would say is like really A-B test everything. Don't go, don't go by opinions. Don't go by, uh, you know, trends. Don't go by things people tell you. Uh, because I think one of my favorite people, uh, Nawal Ravikant says that all of, all of the advice that we have in the world cancels out to zero, right? So yeah, I mean, really A-B test uh, everything endlessly uh, so that, you know, you can be as efficient as possible with your resources. Because again, you're lean, you're bootstrapped uh, at this stage, right? Mm -hmm. And um, just following this process, you can pretty much scale anything, right? So whether it's product, whether it's marketing, or you know, any other function, but especially for marketing, where I feel the, simply the universe of things uh, that you could do, right? Uh, The number of possibilities are endless. So I would, I would simply say these things, right? Yeah. Perfect. I love the way that you laid that out and and just sort of pulled the whole thing together for our listeners. I I love when I'm able to talk with someone that can deliver that kind of insight. Uh, So now that I've effectively picked your brain and seen what I could get out of it, it is time for Uh you to tell us about what you're putting in it. So Rashawn, talk about a learning resource that you've engaged with here recently that's either, you know, informing your approach or just just got you excited these days. Uh, Okay. Uh, So I'm a big fan of Saster and Jason Lemkin. Uh, so I absolutely consume anything and everything that is on Saster. Uh, mm-hmm. I did not have a background in SaaS. Uh, so it, simply my education has been, uh, you know, just following Jason Lemkin on Quora uh, in 2013, 2014, and, you know, even up until now. It's amazing how he can uh, stay so relevant to, you know, whatever you're doing on a on a daily basis, right? So you know, a lot of the times I will read something, I'll see something and it's, it's stuff that I can execute the next day in office, right? mm-hmm. so which, is, which is just amazing. And I also am influenced uh, a lot by Nawal Ravikant, who I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has an amazing podcast and uh, I would uh, really urge people to check it out. Uh, also, I'm a huge fan of uh, Nicholas Taleb. Uh, <laughs> I think he changed my life. You know, just oh, wow. simply understanding what skin in the game is, uh, has been amazing for me. Uh, so these are things that, you know, I mean, I kind of consume, of course, uh, uh, you know, I get all of my news and information from Twitter and there's just like a myriad uh, number of things that, uh, you know, I end up reading on a, on a, on a daily basis. But yeah, if you were to ask me my favorites, uh, these are, these are the three of them, right? So Jason Lemkin for SAS, Nawal Ravikant for anything business and life. And of course, uh, Nicholas Taleb for, for, for everything. Really. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with us. Thanks for, for telling us about, uh, what moves you. I too am getting a lot of my information from Twitter. So <laughs> shout out to Twitter. Uh, and that brings me to my last question for you, which is, I know that folks who are listening, just like me have become fast fans of yours and are going to want to know how they can connect with you. So tell us how can people keep up with you? Okay, so I am on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, I post almost, uh, you know, at least 
two or three times a week on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me at uh, Roshan Karyapa. So that's R O S H A N uh, space C A R I A P P A. Or you could just search for Vimo, and I'm sure I'll show up in the feed. Uh, that's V Y M O, right? Uh, and on Twitter, I'm Carry Got the Blues. So that's C A R Y G O T T H E B L U E S. I love that handle. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, there's so much, like I said, with your experience and and your willingness to take a stance and and really talk about these things with passion that I'll likely ask you to be on the show again. This has been great. Thank awesome. you so much, Rashawn. Talk to you soon. Hey, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.